Um, today is different than a normal Sunday morning for us. And we're calling it simply Vision Sunday. How many of you knew it was Vision Sunday? You came here today because you, okay, some of you did. All righty. Well, what is Vision Sunday? Simply put, it's a chance for us as a church to have a conversation that's a bit different than a normal Sunday morning. Imagine we're taking a step back and we're going up to this big 30,000 foot view to get a glimpse of the incredible journey that God has mapped out for us as a family. Now, I think journey is a fitting and appropriate word for the story of Reach. In fact, it's hard to believe that it's been six years since we started this church. Uh, it was September 2017 that my wife and I, along with some of our friends, old and new, planted this community. We started, like I said, back in 2017, holding our earliest gatherings here in downtown Everett for about six months. Then we grand opened the church and met at View Ridge Elementary School from 2018 to 2020. Pretty short-lived, if you ask me. Of course, the pandemic hit, and during that early part of 2020, uh, at first we scrambled, and then we were gifted this building. And that was a huge blessing to this family, to this community. And we opened it up later that year. And for the past three years, we have been operating out of this place and are so grateful to be doing so. I mean, just the fact that you're in this building today is a testimony to God's sustaining power. But he hasn't just sustained us, right? Many of you have been around and know he hasn't just sustained us, but as our friend Pastor Bob last week said, he's actually caused us as a church to thrive in many ways. And that is not true of, of a lot of churches in our area, really around the country. And, and I don't pride myself in any of that. I don't think we should pride ourselves in any of that. I think the only thing we can do is say glory be to God. Because clearly he had a plan for this place. Amen? Amen. And by the way, you can do that. You can say amen. You can be hyped up today. we got a lot of ground to cover. And I'm going to benefit from the motivation. So if you're excited about something, just let me know, okay? Yeah, thank you. That's great. Some of you are like, oh, geez, what did I just walk into? <laughs> so what are we doing today? Well, like every week, we're going to start out by opening the Bible and seeing what God has for us. Traditionally, what we do is we just open books of the Bible around here and we just take it section by section, which is what we'll do next week. But this week is a little bit different. I want to walk you through a passage today uh, that has really captured my attention as of late personally and share some things that I think have stood out to me personally that really I believe are for a church as well. After that, I'm going to spend a significant portion of time sharing some very exciting updates with you about ways God has been inviting us to live these things out, but also some really exciting updates and, and additions that this church is going to see happening uh, in the immediate and in the near future uh, that I think you're going to be really stoked about. So as we open God's word today, will you please stand for the reading. We're going to read 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11 today. And these are his words. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these, he has given us very great and a, a very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with godly, or, excuse me, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. And all of us said, 
Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. The words we just read clearly come from the second letter of the Apostle Peter, which was written to a variety of New Testament churches in Asia Minor in the first century. Now, this letter wasn't addressed to any one of them in particular, but it would have been circulated among many of them for their mutual benefit. Now, in my mind, these words ring powerful for a variety of reasons. And I can't go through all of it today. It's so much to talk about. I'm just going to highlight a few high-level insights. To kick things off, I want you to consider the life of the Apostle Peter. While his writings are bursting with unwavering and bold directives for the church, you got to understand that his journey as a disciple, as we see it in the Gospels, was quite a roller coaster. How many of you know Peter's life was a bit of a roller coaster? A little bit hectic. From questioning Jesus' capabilities to taking drastic measures against Jesus' adversaries and even denying any association with Christ himself. It's evident that Peter's earlier years were far from the quintessential picture of what a disciple is meant to be. But here's the tragedy. I think we as moderns have a problem when we look back at Peter's life, and it's this. While he was clearly unrefined and reactive and immature in many ways, we often overlook the fact that he didn't stay that way, did he? He wasn't always that brash, unbridled, chaotic disciple. No, in fact, following the resurrection, Jesus affirms Peter's affection for him. He reinstates his mission to nourish the followers of God. He says to feed his sheep. And ultimately, Jesus guides Peter back onto a path of purposeful and productive ministry. So much so that Peter would go on to pen two letters, just like the one we read, which are written to both fuel into flame the faith of God's people, but also to build up and to strengthen the church at large. A a few timeless truths I want to point out. If you're taking notes today, you can jot these down quickly. First of all, just as Peter said to those first century Christians, I believe the same is true of us today. We have been supplied with everything we need to live a life for Jesus. Do you believe that this morning? You have everything you need to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. You may have started out at a different place in your discipleship journey than somebody else. You may have had a hard family background. Whatever your situation may be, you've got to understand, biblically speaking, the promises of God are true. And as Peter tells us in verse 3, the divine power of Christ himself gives us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus. You have what you need to follow Jesus well, even on your worst days. That's a scriptural promise. Secondly, because of this, we are called to stand strong in the face of a corrupt world. Peter tells us in verse 4 that we should escape the corruption that is in the world. What? Because of evil desire. There's corruption because there's evil. And there's evil because we're here. Right? Like we are part of the problem as a human race. Disciples aren't just supposed to survive, though, in the age of brokenness. We're actually called to thrive and to stand strong as a light in the midst of the darkness. That is your calling. That is given to you by God, no matter how weak you feel coming into this building today, how unequipped you feel. Nevertheless, you are called to be a light in dark places. And if God is for us and he's given us everything we need, then I ask you, Who can be against us? Who can be against us? We have the Holy Spirit residing within us. And so because of this, the way we grow in strength, the way we stand strong in the face of a corrupt world and to receive the nutrients that we need is this. We must must supplement our faith with godly virtues to stand firm and to bear good fruit. Now, I want to camp out on that word here for just a second. I've been been spending several weeks reading this passage in a variety of settings and just mulling over it personally. And every time I read it, my eye is immediately drawn to that word supplement. Now, the word in the original Greek, what it simply means is to supply needs, 
or to support and make available what's needed to help. Uh, many of us take vitamin supplements, right? Like you wake up, you take your multi. Some of us take the 55 plus one. It's just whatever your body needs, you take a vitamin to give you the supplements that you need to help you thrive. We do this because we assume there are deficiencies within us. And if we address and nourish those things, those deficiencies will be reduced and our overall health will go up. Makes sense. In the same way, our relationship with Christ is one that we are supposed to nourish and to grow in. That's what our calling is. That our lives are, are structured, are, we should be structuring and designing our lives to, con, to cultivate spiritual health so we can thrive and we can bear fruit as we journey about the, the life of discipleship. I appreciate these words from the New Testament commentator Peter Davids. He says this, the growth in virtue is of utmost importance and deserves utmost effort. We do not automatically become more virtuous as if God infused virtue into us intravenously or like with an IV in our arms. We need to make plans and expend effort. Now, you are here today because I believe, at least I would assume this is true of you, if you came to church in 2023, <laughs> that you want to grow. Right? Like you want to grow in your faith. I believe that. What's important to grasp is that growth isn't a coincidence. It doesn't happen accidentally. Similar to how a vegetable garden demands fertile soil, how specific plants need a trellis to grow upward in growth. And of course, abundant watering and care from the gardener. In the same way, our souls also won't naturally mature spiritually or yield any fruit without deliberate focus on aspects like spiritual disciplines, repentance, turning from our sins, and refining uh, the refining influence of the body of Christ in our lives. In other words, we will not grow unless we are supplying our faith what it needs to grow. Do you get where I'm going today? We need to supply our faith what it needs to help us to grow. Now, Peter goes on to describe a variety of virtues that we can supplement our faith with. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, and so on. And I'm not going to unpack them all right now, but I, I think they are worth your time if you would meditate on them this week and just consider what those things mean. But listen, the outcome of these supplements to our faith is imperative in this message. Listen to his words in verse 8 and verse 10. He says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you would like to be useful and fruitful, not useless and unfruitful? <laughs> yeah, me too. And listen to what he says, because if you do these things, what? You will never stumble. My goodness. So if I'm feeding my faith, what does that mean? It means as you supply your faith, you will not only grow stronger, but your faith will be useful. You will bear fruit, and you will not stumble like you did in a less mature season of your journey. Now, will you be perfect? Absolutely not. Of course, you'll trip and fall from time to time, but you will find the appeal and the enticement of sin lessening in your heart, in the desire to be obedient and faithful growing. That's what happens when we supplement and supply our faith with good nutrients. Similarly, as the church itself grows in spiritual maturity, it will inevitably grow stronger. And as it grows stronger, it will grow in generosity inside and outside of the community. It will deal collectively less with sin and the consequences of sin. It will multiply itself out and be a blessing to other cities and other churches and other communities. And it will advance the gospel both here and near and of course far. Friends, if there's anything I would hope for this church, it is that. 
I mean, you saw the little video snippet. That is my heart for this community, to be a community that is faithful to the gospel and makes an impact inside and outside of these walls. Gosh, isn't that the dream, right? That as we would take steps towards and with Jesus, and we'd be the church he has called us to be, that we would reach our city for Christ for many, many years to come. Now, I will tell you this, and I'll be really honest with you. After six years of leading this church and several years prior helping in other churches, it is only the people who are truly walking with Jesus humbly and faithfully who are being the church. A lot of spectators, a lot of consumers, a lot of know-it-alls, but to truly be the church as Jesus called us to be requires we would walk with him closely and abide in relationship with him constantly. And it's only the churches that are serious about the gospel advancing that are reaching their cities. So how do we do that? How do we do that? I want to pivot today and speak practically to you uh, with some updates for us as a church. I find it fascinating as I look back and reflect on the years previous. Uh, you know, we've done Vision Sundays only two other times in the course of this last six years. And usually at those gatherings, I have mainly recapped our core gathering or our core values and given some pretty simple application steps. And it struck me this week as I was preparing, I was like, that's not what this message is at all. I just have a ton of fun family updates to share with the church. That is really cool. And I'm really excited about it. And I hope you are too. Um, And so I want to, yeah, what are they, Sean? Come on now. Well, let me share some things with you. And I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. I'm trying to be really disciplined on my notes today because there's a lot to cover. I'm going to do that by using three phrases that I've already alluded to throughout this message and the three movements will be this, supplementing our faith, strengthening the church, and serving the city. Those are the three focuses of the rest of our time together today. So let's start with this idea of supplement our faith. In the last year, I have been incredibly encouraged by a multitude of things in this family. I mean, so many cool things have happened, but let me just highlight a few of them for you this morning. To start off, baptisms. To begin with, I want to celebrate the fact that between Easter and our summer barbecue, we have seen 20 people get baptized in this church. It's amazing. Now, I will tell you, we baptize more people at our summer barbecue this summer than we did in the entire year of 2022. So we're already off to a good start. Uh, People are coming back to Jesus, coming for the first time, making public declarations. It is absolutely beautiful. Another area I've been really encouraged by are our Thursday night prayer and worship gatherings. In 2023, we've hosted several of these nights of prayer and worship where we set aside time to be in God's presence, to sing praise, to pray for one another, and to do what it takes to align our hearts with him. In fact, we have one of those happening this evening right in this room. So if you're free tonight, if you're not trying to squeeze out the last bits of sunshine and your heart is longing to worship with time and to pray and to just get your heart set right for the fall, man, you got to come tonight, 6 p.m. right here in the room. We'd love to see you for that event. Another thing I want to highlight today uh, that you may have heard of, but I think, I just personally think was really cool to happen, is Max and Meg Monahan led a Financial Peace University course this year. You guys, uh, I'm calling you out. I have to. It's too good. These guys are so passionate about this. You've done a great job in your personal life in this department and wanted to spread the love with others. And so they invited others to consider practical and biblical principles on how to steward finance as well. And what was awesome about it is we even had people from outside of our church come to this which was so encouraging to me. And so way to go, you two. And uh, really stoked about what God did through that season. And I hope we get to see many more of those to come. Another thing that happened this, this last year was our men's and women's ministries. Both hosted retreats, meetups, and Bible studies, both larger and smaller settings, to help people get connected and grow together. 
I want to call out, we also added Chris Wise as our men's lead. What's up, man? I see you hiding behind somebody's head. <laughs> and uh, so glad that you took the helm leading our men's ministry. Thank you for doing that. We've already seen just so much cool stuff happening through those retreats and through those Bible studies. And, uh, and there's more of that to come. Uh, one of the most amazing things I think we saw happen this year is we ran our second Reach Kids Vacation Bible School, which many of you participated in. Man, did we hustle to get you volunteering. <laughs> and you did. Thank you. This incredible three-day event served kids inside and outside our church and presented several times over the good news of Jesus to children, many of which obtained a greater understanding of what it means to follow and to love Jesus. And we had a blast doing it. And then finally, on Sundays, our Sunday sermon series that we've been through. In the last year, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, we preached through the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. We looked at the armor of God in Ephesians 6. We've studied so far the first seven chapters of Matthew's gospel. We've engaged in a discipleship series, which I think was really important for our church. And we heard this summer from several wonderful guest speakers. Can we just give it up for those who spoke for us over the last month? Some amazing people shared. And I'm excited to be teaching through more of Matthew coming this fall and just wherever else God leads us in the next year. Now, there's plenty of other things I could mention, but those are a few that felt pretty significant and I wanted to share them. Now, moving forward, what are some ways that we can anticipate supplementing and deepening our faith in the year to come? As our team reviewed our all-church survey that we ran recently, one of the things that I found really encouraging that came up often was how hungry people are to grow and to deepen in their faith. The verdict is clear. We are a church that is hungry for more, and I absolutely love that. So <laughs> let me share with you a few ways we intend to supplement our faith. The first one is this, through small group development. Now understand this about REACH, and this has been true since the beginning of our church. Groups are absolutely the backbone to community at REACH. It's absolutely the backbone. And no doubt, those who have found themselves grafting into a group for a decent length of time in a season where they've, they've weathered the storms of life, they've read the Bible together, they've shared meals together, if people are doing those things together, by and large, those are the folks who feel the most connected to reach into what God is doing here. However, what we have found is that groups have life cycles. And oftentimes, uh, they hit a wall in terms of knowing how to grow together. We're great at meals. We handle the screaming kids all right. And there are times we even, but we, there are times we find ourselves stuck in bearing fruit in larger settings, as well as smaller gender-specific DNA groups. And so with these things in mind, we as a team are going to continue supporting and increasing, more importantly, support of our groups and the leaders therein. Our staff is going to do a bit of rearranging to help add extra support to group leaders, and in the next year, our desire is to create both environments and content that will help you grow in your communities. And this will bleed out into our leaders, and it will help our leaders to grow and be stronger, but it will also trickle down to the communities themselves. And so if you're not a part of a group yet, if you have a burden to host and are hospi hospitable and want to create gospel-centered environments for people to just live life and do friendship and, and follow Jesus together, man, I would highly encourage you Take a step in community in some way, shape, or form. It is truly the ongoing backbone, backbone of this community. Another area uh, that we're going to foster and increase in are our classes. Our classes. Uh, there is a desire in this church to explore deeper, deeper conversations around uh, and understanding things like defending our faith, various theological topics, understanding cultural issues of the day, hard topics we're weathering as a society, and a variety of other points of interest. Now, our team has been discussing uh, how we can host one-off classes, maybe midweek or some even like on a Sunday morning, like the old school Sunday school thing that some of you grew up doing. 
Uh, we've got people with the gift of teaching on staff and in this church who are untapped and would be wonderful for environments like this. And so we intend to spend some time as a team prayerfully curating courses that will stimulate our minds and strengthen our hearts for the journey of head. Just by show of hands, how many of you would be curious to participate in something like that at some point or another? Okay, so at least some of us would be maybe interested in that. I hope all of us would at some time, and I think it will be uh, beneficial to your growth. Another area of focus for supplementing our faith is the area of prayer. The area of prayer. I want to call this out because I want to just clarify that this is extremely, extremely important to us. As you experience every week, we do have a prayer team that is readily available to cover you in prayer at the end of every service. I'm so grateful for Robert and Melissa Montgomery and their team who have led us through this season and who actively respond to prayer requests midweek as they come in through the app, through the connect cards, or through our emails. But in addition to adding to our team, which we would hope to do, uh, which if you have a burden for prayer, I would urge you to take a step. Uh, we are also um, building out or have built out an additional space in this church on the mezzanine level that we're simply calling the prayer room. In fact, that is the picture of it right behind me. You may not realize it, but this building has a lot of unused square footage. Some of it you don't want to go in. It looks like a dungeon. But some of it is really nice, including this room right here. It's been out of commission for the last several years. But we have set this room apart specifically, rearranged it, decorated it, and prayed over it for the purpose of prayer. Our prayer team will utilize this before services from time to time, during events, or any time as needed. And at some point we will share with you how this room can be opened more regularly to our congregation for prayer meetings or solo retreats as needed. It's a wonderful space, and I'm really encouraged for you to see it at some point and to pray there. And I'll tell you, if you want to use it for like a business meeting or a small group meeting, you can't because it's a prayer room. <laughs> and we have truly, I mean, I'm dead serious. We have set this room apart specifically for the purpose of prayer. Our staff doesn't even do meetings in there. We just say, man, that is the room that we're going to just treat it as a sacred space. Not that it's anything different than any other room, but it kind of is. And we just want that place to be covered in prayer. And I believe a church that is strong in prayer is a church that is ready to handle whatever God gives them. So setting a room apart like this and continuing to remind us to cultivate, cultivate a life of prayer isn't just symbolic. It truly is a stake in the ground that declares, may this be a house of prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to keep growing in that area. Finally, one of the most pertinent to the whole church is a new course that we're going to be offering that I'm extremely excited about. I'm going to ask Taylor to come up, and she's going to share with us a bit about it. As she does, uh, one, <laughs> one of the observations that we made during our discipleship series was that while our church does well serving people who I would say are already Christians and are part of the church and generally growing, there are two groups of people we identified that we are wildly underserving and want to get much better at. And those two groups are, number one, people exploring faith or who don't know Jesus yet or are growing, brand new believers. And number two, those who we might call spiritual parents or people who are eager to disciple somebody else. Our team has spent countless hours exploring options for content or curriculum that would help us to disciple those coming into faith and to also give spiritual parents a place to be disciple makers and see fruit bear out in the lives of the people that they're discipling. So for this reason, we're excited to announce that this fall we are launching the Alpha Course. Some of you know what it is, and I'm excited if you do. Taylor, will you explain a little bit about what the Alpha course is and why you're excited for it? Yes, I'm so excited. Um, Alpha is a fun dinner series followed by group conversations centered around exploring the big questions of life and the Christian faith 
in a friendly, open, and informal environment. It's a nine-week course that runs in churches, coffee shops, prisons, and homes worldwide. This ministry has continued to be used by the church globally as an effective tool to not only equip new believers with the foundations of faith, but also to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus. Uh, this program's success rate is nothing short of remarkable. Alpha boasts an astounding success rate of 80% and higher, reflecting individuals embarking on transformative journeys with Jesus, whether that's that initial step or progression in deepening their faith. So Alpha really is making a huge impact on people coming to faith in Jesus in the first place and also growing in their relationship with him. And all it takes is prayer and an invitation. That's what I love about Alpha. So think about this. Who do you know in your life in your sphere of influence, maybe it's a fam family member, a friend, coworker, neighbor who doesn't yet know Jesus. Who do you want to meet him and have their life changed by him like yours has been changed? Would you consider that for a moment? And as you do so, I'm going to invite you to uh, pull out. There's this little pink and red card in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't have one right in front of you, I'm sure there's one right next to you. Pull that out. Beginning this week on Wednesday August 30th, we are going to be starting this 21-day prayer campaign leading up to the launch of Alpha. If you open up the booklet, you'll see the call, and it's just three parts in there. Number one is to write down the name of three people you would like to explore faith. And there's space for you to do that on the right. Number two, set an alarm for 1102. 1102 uh, that could be a.m. or p.m., your choice, as a reminder to pray for the three people and your city for the next 21 days. And then number three, be open and expectant to see how God might use you. You know, we often say no to God on behalf of someone else before we allow them to respond. Evangelism is just joining the conversation that God is already having with someone. So be open and expectant to how God might use you in this. And then on the back, there's a simple guided prayer you can pray. You'll also see a little sticky note we put there for you. This is for you to write down the initials of those three people you're wanting to invite to explore faith. To put on our alpha prayer wall that we have in the back right corner there. It's a big question mark back there. So as you leave today... Take that sticky note, write those three initials, throw it up on that prayer wall. Let's fill that wall up today as we collectively commit to praying for people in our lives and in our city together that they might know Jesus. Let's pray together. Save the day. Alpha is going to run on Wednesday night, September 20th through November 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. with dinner and child care provided. Awesome. Thank you, Taylor. So listen, if that's something of interest to you, if you're just taking steps of faith, trying to get a better grasp on what it means to be a follower of Jesus, who he is, what he's done for you, or if you're somebody in the room who would say, man, you know what, like I want to have some of those like, you know, get my hands dirty conversations with people and be able to love somebody in Jesus' name uh, and help them take steps with Jesus. That is the, the call of discipleship, is it not? to walk with one another, to walk with others as they take those steps with Jesus, to help people along the way in their faith. And I encourage you, if you're any of those people, any, if you're interested at all, but especially if you're one of those two parties, will you get involved? Be a part of this with us. We'd love to have you at the table. The second thing I want to talk to you about this morning is this idea of strengthening the church. We've talked about supplementing our faith. A lot of this is reflective. And again, this is not conclusive in everything you could ever do to supplement your faith. There's lots of things you can do. Those are a few changes for us as a church. Similar here. What does strengthening the church look like in this season? What do I mean by that? Well, if you think back to the Apostle Peter's life, what I find so fascinating about it is that while his discipleship journey started off as a shaky one, he ended up becoming one of the most prominent and influential church leaders in the New Testament. Incredible story. He was a keystone evangelist in the early church, which we clearly see in the earlier parts of Acts. He was the writer of two letters in the New Testament, wherein he wrote to brothers and sisters in faith to strengthen them and to build them up in the knowledge of Christ. And he was also a martyr for Christ meaning he died specifically because of his faith under the emperor Nero in Rome. Now Peter went from unpredictable to unwavering. He went from inconsistent to indestructible. 
And it was not by his will or his might, but by the strength of Christ within him. And he gave, his, he gave his very life to build that kind of strength and resilience into the body of Christ, as did many more who came after him. Friends, it's time for us to grow in strength as a church too. It is time. Let me be very specific with you this morning and share what's in my heart for this community and my role within it. I am pastoring this church with the next generation in mind. I'm pastoring this church with the next generation in mind. In fact, I'm also pastoring this church with the next lead pastor in mind. Now, I'm not saying anything by saying that. Don't worry. I don't have any plans to go anywhere today or anytime soon. Don't be alarmed. What I am saying is this. I want this church and I desire this church to be durable and resilient in the days ahead, far beyond and in spite of whatever I can bring to the table. You know, it's been an interesting journey to be the sole lead pastor of this church for so many years. And that's been a slow cook for a lot of reasons. And I'm excited about what I'm about to share with you this morning. Um, But no doubt, it is time for us to grow in strength and resilience and to broaden the shoulders of this community. Now, the reality is, when you reflect on this building, there were two other churches that met here previous to us. And in some sense, we rejoice in the fact that we get to gather here, but at the same time, let that be a sobering thought. That churches in the formalized gathered sense, you know, with a brand name or something, don't necessarily last forever. And between those two churches in this building itself, their collective lifespan in the facility was about six years before it was offered to us. Now, I will tell you this, and and this was true back then when we were even considering this, that this building could have easily been turned into a parking lot if God hadn't opened the door relationally to allow us to gather here. And I don't think that was an accident. I don't think that was an accident. I don't think many of you who stayed here through those transitions are here by accident either. I think your purpose here is incredibly specific. And your history here matters greatly to this present community. But I believe this too, that we as a church, as Reach here in downtown Everett, are on a trajectory for healthy growth. And I believe we're positioned in this community for significant impact. And that our best days are ahead of us. And I know that is a cliche. Believe me, I cringe a little bit saying it. But man, do I believe it. I really believe it. Our best days are ahead of us. So that being said, there are some leadership and structural issues that several of you actually mentioned, I would say, in love in the all-church survey that I want to address this morning and share with you some exciting updates in that department. First of all, I want to talk to you about some of the highest level leaders in our church, which are our elders. It's a very churchy word. But in addition to the words that you find in 1 Timothy and Titus that provide qualifications for elders, let me break down what REACH means when we use the word elder, okay? At REACH, a team of elders carries the responsibility of overseeing the mission and the vision and the life and the doctrine of the church, The elders are biblically qualified men who carry the responsibility and authority of leading the church side by side, who humbly follow Jesus, ultimately, who is the chief shepherd and the true lead pastor of this church. Amen? Amen. Now, a primary way that the elder team fulfills its role is by empowering and caring for the men and women who serve as Reach's staff who lead the day-to-day ministries of the team, of the church. The REACH staff team, including the current and future men and women who will be designated as pastors, preachers, and ministry leaders of all kinds, serve under the authority and the care of the elder team to lead ministries and to equip the people of REACH to do the work of the ministry. So they're ultimately the ones carrying the day-to-day load of the congregation And really even just driving the vision of our church under the authority of the elders. Now here's the deal. I'm going to just be really level with you and explain this very clearly, as clearly as I can at least. 
Our church currently has one official elder, and you are currently looking at him. Some of you are like, triggered, I listened to a podcast about this. Hold tight for a second, please, for context. (laughs) Don't lose your hair this morning. Uh, When I was sent out as as a church planter from Reach Kirkland in 2017, our sending church, I was officially ordained as an elder of this church uh, and commissioned to plant and lead it officially. Uh, In addition, I served on the Kirkland Elder Board for about five years, ending last summer. Their board has also supported us from a distance for those years as well. In fact, I was pinging one of their board members yesterday. On a local level, though, we have had no official elders functioning However, that was never the long-term design. Just as an aside, uh, I was given advice early on, and and I think it's biblically true as well, that establishing elders should be a slow process. It should not be a knee-jerk process. I think when we planted the church, I was really anxious and was like, oh my gosh, I need elders. What are all those people that come from elder churches going to think if we don't have any? And I just had this whole complex about it. But I will tell you, over six years, There have been people who have come and who have gone that in the early days I thought would definitely be great elders and then it became very apparent or clear that they were not ready for something like that. They were not faithful. They were not steady. They were going through crisis uh, that would end in massive turmoil or they would leave the church uh, over something silly. And I just realized, man, like it's a good thing that we've taken our time. And I don't just say that for my own sake. I, I truly mean it, guys. I say this for your sake too. It is good that we have slow played this process. Uh, But during that time, I want you to know that we have not been inactive in preparing to install elders. In fact, I've been incredibly active, having hours of conversation, doing hours of study, preparing documents, readings, all kinds of things with two men, and specifically who have been functioning as elder candidates alongside of me. And these should come as no surprise to you because, one, they've been on the website forever. So if you've looked at our website even once, you would have seen their faces. And, two, because if you're part of this church, you know these men well. And you've been touched by them in some way, I would imagine. And those two men are Jeff Price and Russ Perrin. Can we give a hand for these two guys? Over the last few years, especially since we've been in this building, Jeff and Russ have been key players in several ways. Uh, To start with, you've encountered Jeff as a Sunday teacher a number of times. I still cannot get over the fact that he spilled like a whole bucket of paint on a checkout stand in Lowe's. That was a sermon illustration and it kills me. I love Jeff so much. And I love when he shares and covers the pulpit. He and his wife, Rhonda, in addition, Rhonda, have led several couples through pre-marriage coaching here in preparation for their wedding day. They themselves started our prayer ministry when we reopened. And to be quite honest with you, Jeff and Rhonda have been some of the most encouraging people to my wife, Kara, and I for years, even since they came to the school way back when. Now, Russ is known for, well... Basically knowing everybody. (laughs) Russ meets everybody he can. He is constantly engaging new people. Since we began this church, Russ has has set himself apart as somebody who said, I'm going to try to know everybody's names. It's impossible now, but I think in his head he still thinks he can do it. He's always scanning the room for safety checks. He's always got his antennas up and he provides me insights constantly in ways that he senses God is leading us or ways that it feels like we might be getting off track from our vision. Russ is an avid student of the Bible. If you went to the men's retreat, you heard some of the testimony there. He's walked side by side with several men in our church in their discipleship journey and he often engages those who would be easily overlooked. Russ is truly a shepherd. He really is. In addition, Russ is a key player in overseeing facility operations here, not to mention he and his wife Tammy started and currently host Prepare the Place, which is a bi-weekly Thursday meetup for handy men and women who just want to get stuff done around the building. And they faithfully do it every couple weeks and do an amazing job with willing hands. Jeff and Russ have proven themselves worthy of the call of elder to me and to many of you time and time again, and so it's a great joy to bring them before you for introduction. 
And while they will be volunteers and certainly not carry the same load that I carry as the lead pastor of this church, we will, however, function as a team, a plurality, and they will be my accountability. Some of you just need to hear that. I am not a man on an island, nor did I want to be to begin with. But I just want you to know if that, if that matters to you, and, I, and, I, and if some of you are like, okay, cool. Some of you, that's like a big deal. Just know, like, they will be my accountability, and that matters. Making decisions and keeping our church on track at the highest levels. And so we plan to install them formally next month. And i got to figure out, you know, it's the first one, you know, ordaining elders in our church. So i got to figure out what that's going to mean, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, trinkets I'm going to give them to signify their significance or something. But... You know, we'll, we'll get there, and uh, it's going to be a beautiful Sunday when that day comes. So anticipate that happening in September. Now, moving forward, uh, my hope is that we will add one to two elders in the coming one to two years. And we've been, I've been working diligently on a whole process for how we would onboard people into that role. And so feel free, if there are men in the church that you feel like might be qualified based on the biblical qualifications or just seem like they would be good at shepherding this church alongside of us, uh, go ahead and submit a name to us, the Connect card, and we'll absolutely start praying about it and consider it. Um, and I already have my antennas up, so some of you... Don't even know I'm coming for you. <laughs> Just kidding. No, we're, um, Holy Spirit's going to lead us in that. Okay, let's keep moving. Let's talk about staffing. Okay, let's talk about staffing. Uh, this is another thing that came up often on the, the, the survey. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, one of the most felt groups of people that you encounter on the week-to-week, day-to-day basis who carry the mission forward of the church are our staff. And on screen, you'll see these four ginormous faces, mine being by far the largest. Uh, these four people represent the current and the only full-time staff for this church. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Kara. Gosh, man, come for my wife, that means a lot. Now, that was okay when we were at 250, but we're probably going to have over 400 people in the building today. And so that's a lot of people to oversee for just a, a small amount of us. Uh, a few updates here. One of the most recent additions me, we made was John Dionker there on the other side of me, uh, who we brought on from part-time to full-time to lead our tech team. He's right back there. And our youth team. He's doing a great job. Slides are working well. And we've got over 40 kids typically on Thursday nights coming to youth group, which is amazing. Doing awesome, awesome. And he's a pretty good Sunday preacher as it turns out. With that said, one of my favorite critiques that people had on the All Church survey, which, by the way, was mostly encouraging, uh, a few zingers in there, but uh, one of the best ones was, uh, you need more staff. <laughs> my like, oh, thank you. Thank you for noticing us. Now, as many of you know, over this last several months, I have been doing many interviews to bring more staff onto the team, specifically in the areas of associate pastor and administrative assistant, both key roles that I, I just trust me are going to massively shift the culture and the weight load of this team. Uh, we had around 14 people apply or seriously inquire between these two roles, about seven apiece, which is why the process took me several months. I'm excited to announce that both of these roles have been filled. I'm so excited. Now, I want to give you more details on this uh, so you can know who you're going to be seeing more of or at least who's running things behind the scenes. To begin with, for our administrative assistant, I'm excited to introduce to you again our very own Tyler Betancourt as our new administrative assistant. Yeah, you're right here. So just stand up, give a little pageant wave. Just give him a pageant wave, Tyler. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you know Tyler and her husband Chris, who are some wonderful vocalists and worship leaders on our team. We love you guys doing that. Uh, but in addition, Tyler has done incredible work over this last year supporting Megan, our kids and women's lead, with women's retreats, and now for the last two summers, our VBS program. Lots of administration. Tyler's incredibly administrative, yet she's also very creative, uh, who has already been a huge support to our staff. 
And so it's exciting to bring you on the team, Tyler. I know it's just, it's about a five or 10 hour roll, so we're not taking up all of her time. But man, she's already doing such a good job the, the few weeks that she's been on staff. And we love having you in the room and for all the ways you've alleviated our team and, and just brought so much value. Thank you. We love you. We believe in you. Uh, next, I want to talk about the role of associate pastor. Now, this role took me a bit longer to fill simply because the vetting process is a lot more thorough. I spent, I don't know how many hours, interviewing about seven individuals, both in-house and from outside of reach, over the course of about three months. I, considered, uh, I consider it a significant change to add a full-time staff member, especially one who we would call pastor, who would preach for me regularly uh, onto the team. Uh, for, and, and to have a very public and prominent voice in our church. Believe me when I say these interviews were robust, they were thorough. What's more is I had the chance to interview some incredible people. Every single person I talked to, I was like, I can imagine them in this seat in some way. Incredible people that I had a chance to speak with. But at the end of the day, if you've heard of the four C's of hiring, character, chemistry, competency, and cultural fit, all those things were considered, as well as the clear guidance from the Holy Spirit and counsel from key leaders in our elder candidates. With these things in mind, I'm excited to inform you as well that this role has also been filled. And so I want to bring up a new face for you this morning, somebody that you're going to get to know, and I'm confident you'll get to know and love, uh, our brand new associate pastor, Andrew Adams. Come on up. He's taller than me for the record. <laughs> Andrew, thank you for being here today. Thanks, guys. I'm so stoked to be here. We're so honored and so thankful to be a part of the family reach. Thanks. Yeah. Is it, who, who's this down here? Introduce your This friends. is my wife, Christy. Yes. Christy, would you like to stand? Yeah, go ahead. Give him a pageant wave. <laughs> and that sweet little boy on screen, that's our, our son, Jude. He's in a nursery right now, so if you see him, give him a hug. He's a super extrovert. He'll give you a high five and knuckles. <laughs> he loves Bluey, so if you... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> He's very fun. He's very fun. Let me just brag on Andrew for a second. Andrew and his wife, Christy, and Jude have come from Oakhurst, California. They recently stepped out of a five-year stretch as uh, youth pastors. Now, you may not have realized it, but Andrew was here uh, a few weeks ago visiting. Some of you may have met him uh, checking out Reach during our big family series. Um, and uh, several of you talked to him, and it was very encouraging to see those interactions. Um, that Monday after he came, I went ahead and made him an offer, and he accepted promptly before you got on the plane, I think. As we were on the plane. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I wanted you to have a good plane ride home, not an anxious plane ride home. So... <laughs> Um, now, I'll just say this about Andrew, and then I'm going to ask him a couple questions. Um, he is a sharp thinker. You're going to hear this in his teaching. And this is one of the reasons I'm really excited to have him here is because he's a critical thinker. He is well-read. He is passionate about teaching God's word in large settings and small settings, which I think is going to be such a blessing to this church. He is a believer in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's incredibly easy to relate to and connect with. Unless you don't have a curly mustache, then you might need to grow one to relate. But, um, and he has a heart, a, a huge heart for the local church and for discipleship. And, uh, and that is what we've been praying for. I will tell you, like truly for years, is somebody who fits that kind of profile. Uh, Andrew and I met on a Zoom call training a couple of years ago, loosely stayed in touch since, and over the last year have been getting to know each other just on a more casual level and did even explore talking about a role a while back that didn't really materialize just because of where Reach was at at the time. But the minute we had this role open, I definitely said, hey, well, we're in the process again if you'd like to be considered. And I will tell you, it's been such an honor to get to know this man, and, um, and I just I truly believe you're going to be blessed by him. So, Andrew, just give us just a quick bio so people can know who you are, where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, my name's Andrew, as you heard, my wife Christy, son Jude. We just moved up on Friday from California. We made the drive. We pulled in 9.30, unloaded the truck. Um, man, something about us. We, as Sean said, we love the local church. 
We just have a bleeding heart for the local church and to see the local church build the kingdom of God. Yep. And our, our heart here is to, to really supplement and to support what God is doing here at Reach. And, you know, just as I was praying earlier this morning about what I was supposed to share about, like, our, our ministry unction and just kind of our passions, I really felt the Lord highlight um, those verses in First Peter, just as we were all reading them together, that we would be partakers in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world. And I think that means becoming disciples and followers of Jesus. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about what me and my wife love to do. Um, we have a passion for the word of God and a passion for the spirit that wrote the word of God and empowers us as believers. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, why are you excited about joining the team at Reach? And, and what are you excited about bringing to the table around here? Yeah, we're excited about, man, just about being here, being with this family that's super fun and energetic and exciting. Um, and we are, yeah, we're excited to bring a Holy Spirit unction and also just a desire to see the people of God, you guys, get the word of God in your hands and be filled with the Spirit and going out into Everett, loving people, sharing the gospel. Yeah, it's awesome. I think his part on the team is going to have a lot to do with that classes element that I talked about as well. And so just a lot of the creative juices are going to be flowing over the next few weeks, I'm sure. Um, how can we just be praying for you guys in this season of transition? I mean, clearly you just moved two states. It was a long drive. You made it, though. How can we pray for you as a family? Yeah, be praying for rest and good sleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah, just as we unpack boxes, we want to continually, as a family, hear God's heart for Everett. We want to hear God's heart for you guys and learn how we can come alongside and under you and support you and lift you guys up to be the church that we're called to be. And so just be praying for deep and refreshing times as we just open our Bible, whether it's, you know, with the, the cup of coffee at the window or, you know, as we're loving our son and he's having hard moments driving in the car, that we would be hearing the voice of God on how to love you guys and how to love this city. Awesome. Can we just pray for him and for Christy? If you just around her, just put a hand on her shoulder. Let's just pray for these two and for their son. Yeah, you can just extend your hand if you feel so inclined. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this amazing couple who has come to our family. What a gift. God, I love the way you stitch stories together. And we're so excited to have them here. And Lord, I would pray that just as Andrew was, was just declaring with his mouth, that you would, you would give them a vision as a family of why you brought them here what it means to support the mission of REACH, what it means to be on mission with Jesus here in Snohomish County. We pray for their son, that as he grows over these next several years here, that he will feel just a sense of your presence and joy over him. This community would be one that wraps their arms around them, encourages them, props them up, and ultimately uh, that they too, as they give of their time and their energy, especially Andrew, uh, that they would find so much joy in using their gifts and we would be built up as a community. Thank you for the bringing them to us, and we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we just give it up for these guys coming? Very excited about this. Uh, I just do want to point out, uh, we had goals leaving 2022, going to 2023 for staffing that have all been met this year. So God has been so faithful to provide to make these things possible. Lastly, this, um, and, uh, and I will try to blitz through this, um, serving our city. Serving our city. Many years ago, a phrase came to mind when I was thinking about this idea of evangelism and mission as it pertains to the local church. And I wrote it in a tweet before I deleted my Twitter. <laughs> I should have saved it, a screenshot of it, but it was this. The living missionally doesn't equal a sneaky discipleship strategy. It's being available always to let the gospel spill out to anyone everywhere. It's simple. It doesn't have to be programmed. It doesn't have to be sneaky. It can just be us being the people of Jesus, being obedient and faithful and letting those things spill out of us naturally. And when I read those Gospels, I don't see Jesus always engineering a strategy to be missional. Not that he never had a strategy, but many times it was just that he was available and he trained his disciples to be as well.
Now, the kicker here is that they had to learn how to abide in his presence and follow his example in the everyday to become more missional because that's simply who Jesus is. He's on mission to seek and save the lost. And a lot of times the church will relegate mission or or, uh, evangelism to a ministry or a department, but that will not be us. We will not quarantine two or three people to start a board and to tell us all how we can be missional and then just wait for them to do the work. We will embody the mission of Jesus together. As we supplement our faith, as we grow in strength, we won't be able to help but to serve our city and to be a blessing to those we encounter. So how will we do that? A few ways that you'll see in the season ahead. Number one is this, missional partners alignment. Reach has had a variety of partnerships that we foster in areas of pregnancy, single mothering, human trafficking, foster care, serving low-income families, and even some international ministries. All of these partnerships have come through relationship, typically because we have been approached for their support. Now, while I believe our primary job as the church is to attend to the needs of this body and to help build up the local church, we do desire to see our impact flow from these walls advancing the gospel wherever God gives us favor. And so I'm working with our soon-to-be elders and our finance team to prayerfully consider which of these partnerships are best suited to accomplish these ends. And more specifically, to further the gospel through things like Bible distribution, discipleship programs, as well as tangible support of those in need. And our future in missional partnerships will look a lot more streamlined. And not only in who we partner with and how we support them, but also how you can engage them as a local community. I really want us to be able to participate and to support them more tangibly as a church than just the seasonal highlighting. The second thing in serving our city is this. Everyday evangelism opportunities. Everyday evangelism opportunities. As I said, the gospel is not a program. It's good news, right? It's good news, and it's news that's meant to spill out of every area of our lives. That's why I believe that our greatest evangelism strategy in this church is you. It's you. According to the All all Church survey that we did recently, over half of the people who responded said they came to reach because of a family member or friend who invited them. Not Google, not a Facebook post, none of that. They came because you invited them. Friends, there is no shortcut to sharing your faith and to reaching a city. It is relational, it is time consuming, but it works. It works. That's why I believe Alpha is such a great tool for us. Because to be a part of it, what you do is you invite someone who's curious about Jesus. And that's it. (laughs) You just invite them in. We will host this at Reach sometimes, but my hope is that we would host, host this outside of Reach at times as well to alleviate some of the apprehension people might have about entering a church. And your job is simply to ask. Just to ask. Our small groups are similar. Meals, how easy is that to invite somebody into? Come have a meal with me and my friends. You don't have to be a Christian to come share a meal with somebody. You can just experience Christian community. Start looking for ways, friends, that you can invite people outside the church into your world. And I'll tell you, our team is brainstorming and praying about ways to equip you to do that well and naturally and authentically. Now, finally, I want to talk to you about one of the reasons why we are here to begin with that I think is still in the bones of this church, and it's this. It's church planting and partnerships. And at this time, I'm going to invite the band to come up as we're going to close here in just a second. Since our inception, we have known that church planting is in our DNA. In fact, that is us several years ago. I've talked to Russ about this so many times. We know that there's a time that will come when a planter or a group, a core team, will begin forming and preparing to plant another church, whether it's called reach or whether it's called something else entirely. Now listen, the early church multiplied and continues to multiply because of efforts like this. Why? Because the local church is the vehicle that Jesus chose to carry out his mission till he returns. I think a lot of times we think it's somebody else. It's another plan B. It's another nonprofit. No, friends, this is his plan A. 
It can look different ways. I will tell you, around the world, it certainly looks different ways. But this, the body of Christ, is his plan A. And my hope is that within the next three to five years, we will have set aside some funds, identified a leader, and have made adequate preparations to train up and send someone from this community to start a new church that will impact a city. Now, in addition to planting, what you've got to understand is that many churches over the last several years have struggled greatly to recover post-pandemic. Uh, the, the, the COVID stuff, the political unrest, and so many more things have disrupted communities to their core. Pastors are lonely and burned out. Church bank accounts are depleting. Staff are being let go. And I've talked to many who are tempted to throw in the towel. Can I tell you what I believe this church is meant to do? It's to encourage and to lift up communities just like that. I, I don't think we're here just for us. I don't think we're here just for us. In fact, I currently co-lead with another area pastor, something called the Everett Area Pastor's Prayer. And it happens monthly here at Reach. And we gather anybody from ever area, Snohomish County, to come together once a month to pray and to encourage each other. But we're talking about expanding then that and having more of a network mentality where churches can come together for training and equipping and nights of worship and prayer and just opportunities to be fueled together if they're on mission together. There's a lot of like-minded communities all around this county that we want to be a blessing to. And we believe that we're positioned to be that. And so between planting and partnerships, I believe that this church is positioned to make a serious dent in the community for Jesus. And if that's something you feel specifically burdened by, will you come find me directly? I'd love to buy you coffee. Well, in summary, what should you focus on? Let's just put these things on the screen. Supplementing our faith. I'll just ask you this, how will you take steps towards and with Jesus this year? How will you do that? Will you get more involved in a community group? Will you cultivate a lifestyle of prayer and worship? Will you take a class? Maybe talk about helping to facilitate a class? Join Alpha? Help facilitate Alpha? What does it look like for you to supplement your faith and to help somebody else do the same? Consider those things. How about strengthening the church? Will you commit to contributing to the health and to the strength of this church. Will you pray regularly for our staff and for our elders? It means the world if you do. I woke up this morning with all kinds of spiritual warfare going on, it felt like at least. Will you pray for me? We pray for our team? Help us to, to carry the load by, by offering your prayers before God? Will you give financially to help support the mission of this church? Clearly we have big dreams and big focuses. Will you know that we're not gonna exploit you or, or do anything that we feel like is bad stewardship with the dollars that we've been entrusted with? We wanna use those things faithfully. We keep a tight budget around here and we really try to channel those budgets to, uh, to help do the things that matter most to this church. And so will you give financially? Will you also help carry the weight of this church by loving and serving each other? In the old days, a lot of times people relied on the pastors to do everything for them. Can we not be like that? Can we pray for each other? Can we in worship when somebody seems like they need an encouraging word or a prayer, will you take a step and actually do those things? Will you be the ambassadors of Christ that you've been called to be to one another? Let's strengthen the church. And then finally, let's serve our city. How will you commit to serving our city? Who are you gonna invite to Alpha? Who are you praying about? Whose initials are you gonna throw on the sticky note and put on the wall? Are you gonna do a prayer walk sometime? Are you gonna go grab some coffee and then walk the city and pray? Are you gonna to talk to somebody who's on the street and ask them how they're doing, if they need anything, if you can pray with them, share the gospel with them? Are you a church planter? Are you meant to be part of a core team? Are you somebody like me who would say not in a million years? and yet God would be stirring your heart. And maybe it's time for you to take a step and say, well, I should at least explore that. We're called to serve our city. And this isn't just for us, it's for our kids, 
It's for our neighbors. It's for the city. And it's all to bring glory to our King Jesus who reigns on his throne, is coming soon, and who will dwell among his people forever and ever. Amen. Amen.